I was incredibly excited to jump into this community. Like Dylan said, uh, for a long time now, I've thought about um, how things move around in neurons, starting with understanding the roads themselves. Um, in my PhD work, I actually studied rare um, mutants to tubulin genes, which are the building blocks that form the roads. And so it was a really natural progression for me to jump into this work with the KIF-1A community and translate a lot of the things that I had learned about um, just neuron function and how to study um, mutant uh, consequences and apply that to the KIF-1A mutants. Um, and so one of the things that I was especially excited about um, uh, being a part of the KIF-1A community was when we started discussing this IPSC um, new resource from that the Jackson Lab was developing. I was sure to be on every one of those Zoom calls because I had very strong feelings about which mutants we should use to represent our community. Because I wanted to have the opportunity, um, you know, as researchers, we are only as good as the tools that are available to us. And um, for a community like this, where there are so many different variants that represent so many wonderful uh, can superheroes and the families. And I wanted to be able to create a short list of mutants that would apply more broadly to, uh, you know, to classes of how these mutations might alter kif one a function. And I'll get into that um, a little bit more so you can understand what I'm saying with the help of visual aids. Um, starting out, uh, I like to start out broad. Here in this room, we're all familiar with KIF-1A. It's a kinesin, um, but looking even beyond that, it's so important because our bodies are really regulated by this incredible nervous system, which is comprised of billions of nerve cells or neurons that are in the brain and the spinal cord and all throughout our bodies. And these cells can talk to each other through signals um, that is received by one and transmitted to the other through synapses, which we've heard a lot about um, over uh, these last two days. And um, one of the major questions that I'm interested in, and we're interested generally in the Holtzberg lab, is how do these kif one mutations that have been identified alter neuron function in the cell? What is it doing in the cell to cause these clinical manifestations? And one of the challenges that we have as researchers when we uh, start to address this is the fact that there are so many different variants that have been identified. Um, here's a, a beautiful schematic just showing all a, a whole host of different variants. They uh, mostly cluster in the motor domain, but they can be found throughout. Um, one of the ways that we can try to uh, organize this list is by grouping them as they've done here by where they are located within the protein. But another way that you can group these mutations is by what they're predicted to do to the kinesin motor protein function. And so just to remind everyone, these uh, kinesin motor proteins, um, wild type, which is the sciencey way of saying normal. Um, so you'll see that sometimes in, in different uh, science talks. But when I say wild type, I just mean normal non-mutant motor. Um, and so a normal protein must come together and dimerize. So it has those two feet to walk on the microtubules. It has to bind its cargo. It has to bind to the microtubule and it has to be able to appropriately transport its cargoes throughout the cell. There are certain mutations that can cause loss of function or uh, a lessening of its ability to perform its normal job. And there are different ways that a protein, uh, mutations to a protein could, could cause this. Uh, mutations can cause a truncated prote protein, which means a short protein that doesn't have all of uh, the domains. Um, it could cause it to not be able to dimerize with its partner to be able to for have those two feet. It could cause it to not be able to bind its cargo or the microtubule, or generally just diminish its ability to walk along the microtubule, which a lot of them we know decrease velocity and run length. Um, conversely, you can have mutants that might act as a gain of function, where the protein is acting, enhancing its function beyond what it normally does, or taking on new roles within the cell. One potential uh, 
a way that a kif one a mutant could do that is through these mutations that we call call Riger, where they bind to the microtubule and don't let go. And so these could potentially be worse than having no KIF-1A at all, because it's binding, it could be trapping cargoes there and also causing roadblocks so that other motors can't go where they need to go. Um, really interestingly, and what we just heard uh, about was a hyperactive motor where the motors can actually go too fast and too far. And that's a very different situation than a motor that isn't able to go far enough. And so uh, one of the things that I was really interested in when we generated um, these lists of mutants, it was seeing, are each of these mutants going to have an end result on neuron function in a similar way? Or are they gonna affect the neuron differently? Because that's gonna be really important for understanding the disease can progression for all of our KIF-1A superheroes. And also for thinking about typical, or thinking about therapies and treatment strategies for different um, uh, patients with different mutations. Um, and so I had introduced this before, but I was really excited to um, get my hands on this wonderful IPSC line that it, where um, the Jackson lab led by Kat and Justin were able to generate on the genome, these kif one variants in a IPSC line that's isogenic, which means all the other genes in this line are the same. So one of the potential setbacks of using human-derived IPSC or patient-derived IPSCs is that every person is, one of the wonderful things is every person is unique and different, but that also comes with a whole bag of other uh, different mutations. And so by having these in an isogenic background, we can really with confidence compare KIF-1A function and cellular outcomes across different mutations, as well as back to that wild type normal protein and cell. And so when we picked these out, um, I advocated for the inclusion of a protein that is predicted to, uh, this is a, what this means a C92 stop it's basically an early truncation that we believe leads to no KIF-1A uh, protein in the cell. It's a, such a short truncation, we think that it's getting degraded and there's no actual KIF-1A um, as a result of this protein. Um, we also included mutations that were thought would be a loss of function, including um, this R13H would be unable to bind to the microtubule and the P305L, which um, can bind to the microtubule, but it doesn't walk as effectively. Um, and then we also included a Riger mutant, which we expect will bind to the microtubule and not be able to progress past that, um, as well as a hyperactive motor that will, you know, these KIF-1A motors were called marathon runners. This is a ultra marathon runner, which will go faster and farther than the normal. I and mean, so even though this list looks pretty short, um, it actually represents a much longer list of KIF-1A mutants that are found in the community because um, these, uh, what we learn from these can be applied back to the broader class of the different um, molecular uh, predicted functions of the mutants. And so um, when we got these from the Jackson lab, we got a vial of IPSCs, um, but we wanted to be able to turn them into the cell that matters most for uh, the KIF-1A disease, which is the human neuron. Um, people have talked about this before, so I'm gonna go over it very briefly. Um, but the way that we do this in the Holtzbauer lab is we stably integrate um, a driver, which turns it into a neuron, specifically NGN2, um, and we can get these iPSCs into neurons relatively quickly to assess different cellular functions. Um, as I mentioned before, Keras has been uh, just an amazing force. We have a lot of different cell lines. Um, I think there's 10 available right now. We've focused on the home mosaicus variants. So what that means is that even though most canned patients are heterozygous for the mutation, we wanted to focus on what happens when all of the protein in the cell has the mutation. And that helps us dissect easier what that mutation is doing. It just kind of clears uh, some of the complications away. So we can see if all of the motor in the cell is P305L, what does that mean? Um, and so we were able to take these homozygous cells, um, turn them into neurons. And so it was like, okay, we got that. What are we going to look at? Um, the first thing uh, that we wanted to look at 
And uh, so this goes all the way back to Japan in the 90s. Um, when kip one a was first identified, it was classically described as a carrier of these important synaptic cargos. And so the first thing that we wanted to do in these cells was to look at their ability to carry synaptic cargos. And in order to do that, we use live imaging, um, which means we grow these neurons. And in these neurons live, we watch how their um, cargos are distributed by KIF-1A motors. And so this is what that, an example of what that looks like. Here's a video of synaptic cargos being transported through the cell. And in order to analyze this, we use something called a chymograph, which is like a map of where things have been over time. And so you can see that some of these uh, cargos move um, from left to right, which is what we really care about in this room. Unfortunately, the formatting didn't work out there, but um, that's the anterogression that is being driven by kinesins. Um, things also go in the opposite direction. There's someone in the room who's very interested in dynein, which is also an important motor. It carries things in the opposite direction. Um, but for today, I'm focusing on the cargos that are moving, that are being moved by kin the kinesin motors, KIF-1A, in the anterograde direction, and they're going to be in green. And so uh, just to orient you here on this chymograph for normal or wild type, you can see a lot of these green streaming lines over the course of this map which represents a lot of synaptic cargos being carried by KIF-1A um, uh, through the axon. If we have mutants that are predicted to either completely get rid of KIF-1A, so this is a homozygous early truncation, so we don't think that these cells have any KIF-1A, or have a homozygous mutations that predicted to um, decrease the motor run length or velocity, we see a marked decrease in the number of these streaming synaptic cargos. Um, interestingly, with the Riger predicted mutant, the T99M, we also see a reduction. Um, but strikingly, when we have the hyperactive motor, you can see even more of these synaptic vesicles moving through the cell. Um, and so we can quantify that into plots like this. This is preliminary data. We actually have two more sets of this experiment that we're currently analyzing right now. But even with this early data, we can see differences between these different classes of mutations that we've been able to look at in the cells. So um, what we're seeing unsurprisingly is that when we have these loss of function KIF-1A mutants, we're seeing a decrease in the uh, the cargo flux, which means the number of uh, vesicles that are being transported. Um, there's a trend now towards more of those in the hyperactive mutant. Um, interestingly, uh, and somewhat surprisingly, if we look in these cells that don't have any KIF-1A, we still see some of these cargos being moved and they're moving quite rapidly, which suggests to me that in these cells, there are other potentially kinesin-3 um, motors that are able to compensate a little bit. Obviously not very well, there's not, there are not very many, but there are some cargos being able to be trafficked out in this situation. Um, and in fact, uh, I think that what we're seeing with this is that for these um, mutations that either reduced or uh, predicted that we know should reduce the velocity um, and run length from like uh, single molecule re constituted work, I think that what we're actually seeing here are these cargos that are being trafficked by something else. Um, and then interestingly, this single point mutation is able to get that marathon runner to go even faster, which still just kind of boggles my mind. And uh, the structural people could help, help me understand that. Um, so now that we know that these synaptic vesicles, there's, there's issues with, with how they're moving in these different mutants. Um, one of the future directions that we're currently working on is seeing how that plays out downstream. What does that mean to the cell and its uh, synaptic connectivity? And so uh, we struggled with this for a lot, or I struggled with this for a while in the lab um, with the fact that eye neurons, human eye neurons in a dish don't necessarily like to form synapses with one another, but I found that both by extending culture time and co-culture with astrocytes, I can get a uh, robust connectivity and I'm using what I learned um, just with wild type cells to now test that with all the different 
kinase and uh, kip one a mutants to see how they alter uh, the, just the number of synapses. Um, particularly, so when we say a synapse, like I mentioned at the beginning, it's really a, a connection between two cells. There's a, a cell that's sending the signal and a cell that's receiving it. And the data that I showed looking at the synaptic cargos were all on the cell that uh, the, the presynaptic side. And so um, one of the ways that we're able to dissect presynaptic function and Kifune's uh, ability to uh, regulate both the formation and function of those is through an assay that lets us to have uh, spatial and temporal control over we, where presynaptic zones form. And so this assay involves isolating the axons microfluidically and then adding non-neuronal cells that have the postsynaptic partner um, and then seeing how the presynaptic zones form in response to that. And so we're also using this assay to understand these different kip one mutants. Um, beyond synaptic connectivity, we're also very interested in kip one role in regulating um, neuron morphology, which just means how the neurons look. Um, and so we were able, this is all data from Karis. She did a great job. These are not the easiest uh, experiments to quantify. Um, but what she found is that when there's no kip one a in the cell, there's a marked reduction in the cell's ability to extend neurites. And so at this stage, these are neither axons or dendrites. It's kind of a uh, you know, a nascent version of both. Um, but we see that there are shorter neurites both in the no KIF1A condition, as well as the P305L, which is the reduced um, velocity and run length mute motor. And that really nicely um, uh, mirrors what we saw from Wayne yesterday. Um, interestingly, the Riger mutant uh, also causes a decrease in neurite length, but strikingly also causes problems with neurite sending out the appropriate number of neurite. So, as you can see from this example image, all of these here are just sending out one. Um, whereas in the other conditions, you typically have a neuron be able to break polarity and send out multiple neurites. And this I think is, is especially interesting given that patients with Riger mutations are frequently the ones that um, present with microcephaly, which means small brain, and suggests that these uh, cells might have an issue with expanding the gray matter of the brain, which is, is the, the cell body and its uh, uh, neurites. Um, and then uh, for the hyperactive mutant, we see no change in neurite outgrowth in this assay. Um, so, this is also future directions, but I think will help shed light on a lot of the mechanism of what I've shown you today. Um, one of the, the major thing that I asked for in my KIF-1A mini grant was actually a series of uh, vectors that will help us visualize mutant KIF-1A inside of the cells. So we have all these cells that have untagged um, KIF-1A working in the cells, but we can't see what it's doing. Um, what I've shown you before was by labeling its cargos and seeing what's happening with them. But to understand what the actual motor is doing, I want to be able to see it in the cell. And so we're using this strategy to stably integrate KIF-1A um, tagged um, both wild type and, and motor protein so that we can see what's happening. And this is going to inform both why KIF-1A is important for neurite outgrowth. Like there's very interesting data showing other roles for, uh, for other kinesins in this, um, but so far we don't exactly know why KIF-1A, like is it accumulating in the tips? Is it really actively streaming stuff out there? We don't know, but we'll be able to tell with um, once we have these resources, as well as looking at um, how it's distributing the cargo. So as I mentioned before, um, when we think that there's no KIF-1A, we still see these synaptic cargos going out there. Are they actually somehow being driven by these mutant KIF-1A motors? Um, this assay will help us determine that. And so with that, I just want to summarize what I showed you today, um, where we've been able to use this really amazing IPSC line generated by Jackson Lab to look at different classes of KIF-1A mutants to understand how they're altering 
cellular function. And so uh, our loss of function mutations, both when we have no KIF1A or we have KIF1A that's not able to walk as effectively, we see reduced synaptic cargo flux, which means that there's less cargo, synaptic cargo getting into the axon and moving, as well as decreased neurite length. For our gain of function um, hyperactive mutant, we see actually increased synaptic cargo flux, but no change in neurite outgrowth. And then this really interesting case of the Riger mutant, which I put in the loss of function as far as like its cellular consequences because it causes reduced synaptic flux and decreased neurite outgrowth. But for both of those, it seems to be doing it worse than having no KIF1A in the cell. And so with that, I will just thank my lab. Thank you guys so much. The interactions I've had here have been amazing. Um, and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Egan. I'm gonna ask you one question from Zoom and then we'll take one audience question. Uh, the question, which may actually be interesting to Lisa too, is do these mutants also affect retrograde transport, especially in R350G? Is there is there a chance that these kinesin mutants could also impact retrograde? Yes, I actually have that data analyzed. I didn't include it here for time. Um, but what we're seeing is maybe a trend towards more retrograde transport um, in these, which makes sense. And we're actually seeing a similar thing for the loss of functions too. Like if there's less going out, there's less coming back. If there's more going out, there's more coming back. Um, as far as velocity, there's no significant changes, which makes sense because we aren't predicting uh, to affect the way that dynein is walking on the microtubule. Thanks. Um, with these four or five uh, groupings of of mutants that you describe, and some go too fast, and some go too small, and short, or whatever. Um, do all of our community members, is all, all the identified um, mutations among us all, however many there are, does each one of those fall into one of those buckets? That's a wonderful question, and it's actually why I asked the question of uh, one of the previous presenters about the R203S. Um, yeah, so. I, I predict basically, if you just think about what could happen to a mutant, I think that they will fall within those categories. The problem is we don't know for each individual variant, what's it, what is it gonna do? And that's why, so these cellular assays that we're doing, I think are incredibly important, but it's also really important for these uh, uh, in vitro single molecule assays to continue to be done. So what to answer that question is what we would like to do is create KIF1A mutants with all these different variants and see, do they bind to a microtubule? Yes, no. Do they move on the microtubule? Yes, no. How fast do they go? And then with information like that, you could have these broad classes and then categorize all these different mutants within them. Um, and people, uh, people are doing that. There's a, just a wonderful paper out on BioArchive. Um, I think there were like, gosh, 12 mutants, maybe even more where they started doing things like that. So that that is being done um, and we'll start to be able to, to see where each of these go, but we just don't have information for all those variants quite yet. 